spent essentially all of our time in Proverbs chapter, chapters 1 and 2. And the reason why we're doing this is to gain um, a better understanding of what this issue of crying Abba Father means. Uh, it's again a very significant thing and I also mentioned that it's one of the hardest things to kind of teach because uh, this is not something that uh, I can do for you. I uh, simply present the information and this is something that needs to take effect uh, in you. And um, it's also harder than maybe some other things because any times you're dealing with um, when you're talking about the, your heart, uh, not, necessarily, not even your physical heart, but our inward man heart and our mind as receiving invisible um, information. information. I mean, we have words on the page, but when we read it, uh, and we're talking about wisdom and understanding and knowledge and those type of things, uh, it's not easy to always talk about how it all works and those type of things, but rather, uh, hopefully, by talking about the things that we have, it gives you at least a sense of what the, our Heavenly Father is looking for in connection with what He's provided us and what we already have come to know that He's provided us and, and what, he's, what's, what He holds out to us in His Word. Uh, he's provided to us, but as we're going to come to learn it, that our, resp our, our heart response ought to be positive towards that. And that's, the, to put it very lightly. Um, and, um, and I say lightly because in the context of not only when Paul uses this expression, Abba Father, but the only other time outside of Paul's epistles, in Mark's gospel, it's used, uh, it's used in a context of, of suffering and of dependence and reliance and, and submission to the Father's will, even in suffering. And, um, and so it's, it has a lot more gravity to, than just talking about it in the way I just did. But um, we're going to turn back to Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 2. And again, what we're trying to get accomplished here is to look at if you're able to break down a positive heart response to the Father's Word, um, then that's what we're trying to do. And we're here in Proverbs chapter 2. We've already looked at Proverbs chapter 1, verses 7 through, I believe it was 19 there. Um, and we looked at the Father's wisdom, and he tells them to hear, don't consent to the sinner's wisdom, as they're going to entice thee and say some things to you, um, say some things to the Son here. And uh, then the Father comes along and says it's death, it's evil, it's greedy, uh, and all those type of things. So don't consent to it. Hear the Father's word. Although with the sinner's enticement, there's substance, there's spoil, uh, there's some type of rich riches there. Uh, in, in essence, it's, it's death. And listen to the Father's words, listen to what He has, because it will be a crown of, of an ornament of grace upon your head. And uh, not only that, but it will be chains about your, about your neck. There's promotion, there's glory when you listen to the Father's words. Uh, and so the exhortation essentially is there is hear His words, don't hear the sinner's words. Don't hear uh, the, the wisdom of what Paul says, the wisdom of the world. And we'll, we'll look at all that more as we go on. But then when you get to Proverbs chapter 2, it kind of builds upon that. It, it, it builds upon in the sense of the, the measure of your hearing. And we gave the example before, it's very possible, and I gave myself as an example um, of being able to, having the capacity to hear, hear something, but it has no effect. Uh, we use that expression, it goes in one ear and out the other. It's oftentimes used in school. Um, and rather, we ought to hear it for the sake of applying our heart to that information and applying our heart to understanding. And that's where Proverbs chapter 2 kind of picks up. It, it, it builds upon the, the measure of our hearing. What should be our engagement? To what measure should our response be? And this is oftentimes, I, I will say, this is oftentimes neglected. Um, we'll, we'll talk many times about reading and studying God's word. And we'll talk about things that we should be doing. But to what measure? Uh, that, that, that isn't focused upon. But rather, but when we look at the scriptures, it is. I, I, one off the bat comes to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. There, I forget the exact verse. Verse 9 comes to mind, but that, that could be completely wrong. But where it says, well, let's look there. Look Hebrews 11. Verse 
Good thing we came here because it wasn't nine. It was an upside, upside down nine, six. Hebrews 11, verse six. It's this hall of faith chapter. And he says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that seek him. Yeah. That word is describing the measure of the seeking. It's a, it's a very significant word in the verse. Those that diligently seek him. The opposite of diligence is slothfulness. Well, according to Proverbs, it is. It's slothfulness. You know what sloth is? You go to a zoo and you see a sloth. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's so slow. It's, it, 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 it just doesn't, there's no urgency. I don't know if sloth even has the capacity to be urgent at all. But it sure seems like it does. But it's, it's slow. Diligence is the opposite of that. There's some urgency, there's some, there's some quickness to it to, to get some things done. And we ought to hear the writer saying, diligently seek him. Uh, come, come with me to Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. I was talking to Cody at the break, and we, I was talking about this issue. We were talking about the issue of God writing things on our heart and how we have a, we have a role in that. Um, in fact, God made man with the ability to write things on his own heart. Uh, we do that all the time with, with certain things, things that are important to us, we value and esteem. And the difference now is that we ought to value and esteem his things, the, 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 the spiritual things, the things of the spirit, and have those things written on our heart. And he's going to write them on our heart. He's going to provide them. And as we, as we respond to them, that's the, that's the formula, if, you were, if I could say that, the formula of have it written on our heart. And... Um, just like anything else. I mean, uh, you listen to music or listen to the news or you've gone to school and you got some other, uh, read a book and you have some source of wisdom there. There it is for you. It's designed to communicate something to you. How much are you going to, how much are you going to give it uh, uh, dominance in your life? How much are you going to have it hold sway in your life? Some things you just throw out the window, some things you, you actually consider and you give time to and you think about, and it's those things that you give that time to that really become prominent. The issue becomes now with, with our Father's words is that's what our Father's words should be to us above all else. And so this issue of seeking and diligently seeking ought to become a hallmark feature of our minds and our hearts and our lives before God. But look at verse 3 of Colossians chapter 3, I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 3 verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, what's the next word? Seek, Seek those things which are above. And here's, here's the, there's a lot that's going to go on with this next statement clause here. But it's supposed to provide for you some significance and, and, and compel you to seek those things that are above. He says, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. The, the reality and the fact that Christ sits at the right hand of God ought to be one of the reasons and compelling factors of why you're going to seek those things that are above. And when you compare Christ sitting at the right hand of God in lieu of anything else that can motivate you to seek something, that should give you some diligence and place some emphasis upon you seeking it. Because there's no greater position, there's no greater place to be than at the Father's right hand. And the very things that you seek are where Christ sits at the right hand of God. And so that should, that gives a little more emphasis and, 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 and uh, description upon the measure of your, your seeking. Is, yes, you're seeking, but you're seeking is something where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Why? For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Where Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you appear with him in glory. So all those things are made, the, the, the glory and, and Christ and him being at the right hand of God, all those things are factors into your seeking. And the measure of your seeking is reflective of your understanding, your appreciation, your esteem of those things. 
the glory, the right hand of God, God himself, Christ, the fact that he's sitting, all those type of things. And so again, that's what we're looking at. And, and I'm trying to bring those concepts and, and look at these things maybe at little different angles to gain a further appreciation of this, this measure of this cry of Abba Father, what's, what's involved in it. And hopefully these things are, 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 are providing some of that. Well, come back with me to Proverbs chapter 2. So in Proverbs chapter 1, it was the issue of the exhortation of hearing the Father, but now you get into some more of the details of the measure of, of your hearing the Father's words. Pick it up here in verse 1. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine heart unto wisdom, and not just incline your ear, I'm sorry, incline thine ear unto wisdom, not just incline thine ear, but once you get that wisdom, Apply your heart, because that's where it's going towards. Apply thine heart to understanding. See how it all works and, and see certain features and implications and ramifications. But you're not letting it slip. You're not letting it go out one ear and out the, come in one ear and go out the other. You're, you're, you're interacting with it. And so we talked about these two things here in verse 2. Are the issue of an honest attendance toward the Father's words. That good and honest heart and an honest inward engagement with the Father's Word. So one is just the issue of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attend to my Father's Word. I'm gonna, I want to listen to Him. The other one is an inward engagement with the words. And that's the issue of hearing it and then interacting with it in your, in your mind, in your heart, as you receive those things. And then verse 3, yea, He's going to intensify this even more. That's what that word does. And even comes along and says the second thing is, 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 is greater, as it were. He says, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding. There's a continual pursuit of the Father's knowledge. And not only that, but a continual engagement with the Father's heart. Because if we want to lift our voice up for understanding, then we're communicating unto Him, and we're, we're, we want His understanding. Because if we're going to lift up our voice for understanding, and we're going to request to get understanding, then that understanding is going to come from Him. So there's this communication going on between us and Him. All for the sake of the knowledge and the understanding. Because it's His. It's Him. When we get His understanding, we get His knowledge. We're learning Him. And that's where we left off. And we, well, I guess we began to introduce the third one here. He says, if thou, by the way, there's three ifs that lead into a then. It's not, a, it's not the if-then of the law contract. It's basically the, if you want me, then you'll get me. And here's the three ifs. Verse 4, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for, as for hid treasures. By the way, I, I, will, I will say this real quick. These things, again, and I know you might not see it now, but we'll, by learning these things, if you read the Bible through from front to back in the order which is presented, you'd be encountered with this stuff first before you get to Paul. And what I, what, what I want to communicate in saying that is that these, these concepts, Paul doesn't remove himself from these concepts. There's a reason why in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, when he talks about building upon the foundation of Christ, not to build wood, hay, and stubble, but to build gold, silver, and precious stones. In fact, it's my understanding that from Proverbs, you can learn what that gold, silver, and precious stones are. At least boil it down to have a good, educated guess. And it's, and it's the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that Paul gives us building upon that foundation of Christ that we're going we're gonna to utilize. But here you have the fundamental features, or the fundamental uh, uh, orientation to those things. It says, if thou seekest her as silver. One, I think it's very interesting that now the knowledge and understanding and the wisdom become, are, are given the pronoun her. If her's a pronoun. Her. And the reason why I think that's significant, because you have this, one, because who is the father talking to here? 
his son, right? In the context, the father's talking to the son, and now he's going to talk about the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding as a her. As this union, living union relationship that the son should have with her. This wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And he says, if thou seekest her as silver. Notice again, you, you get a sense of the measure of the seeking by what it is that he's comparing the seeking as. As to what? As to silver. He doesn't say, if seekest this thing as you'd seek a mouse. Or seek, seek her as you would seek a piece of grass. Seek her as silver. There's value, worth to silver. Seek it as such. And silver again, especially back in, back in the day, I'll say it that way, was utilized, it was utilized, and it had most uh, common features to that of, of, of money. And that's one of the reasons why money is valuable, not only because it has some intrinsic value, but because of what you're able to utilize and purchase. And so he says, if thou seekest her as silver. And then he's going to build upon it. It almost looks exactly identical in this next clause, but it's not. He says, and searchest for her as for hid treasures. And the reason why you know it's a little different because of the words that are being used. One, searchest, and that is used in connection with you're going to search for her as for what? Treasures or what kind of treasures? What if you got hid treasures? What, what, goes in the vault, what goes into searching out a hid treasure? A hidden treasure. Yeah, a lot of time and work. A lot, yeah, digging. I, I don't know if you ever see that Nicolas Cage movie, uh, National Treasure. The whole movie is about finding the, find the treasure. They're going to this place, going to that place. Looking to this clue, looking to the next clue. Now that's, that's a really bad example, but... That's the, that's the kind of thing, the issue of, you know, we're going to find the treasure. X marks the spot, right? And yeah, go over here and over there and cross the sea and cross far lands and, and all these type of things. And it's hid. And even though you get to the place where it's supposedly the treasure is, it's still hid. You gotta, you gotta, you're in that place and you've got to find it. And so there's some time, there's some labor that goes into that. But it doesn't mean just because it's hid that you won't find. In fact, that's what the next verse says. And if you seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for head treasures, verse 5, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and what? Find the knowledge of God. And that's what the Father is saying to the Son. Here's the measure of your positive heart response that I want towards my words. If you come along, if you incline your ear to wisdom... If you apply your heart to understanding, you cry after that knowledge, you lift your voice for that understanding, you seek her as silver, and you search as her for hedge, you're going to find it. That's a promise. You're going to find it. Boy, that gives me great hope. It should give you great hope, too, as me being your pastor. <laughs> because if that wasn't there, then we would all be in big trouble. Search, 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 but you can't find. Can never come, as Paul's going to say, to the, what? Knowledge of the truth. You know, it is possible to ever learn, but never come to the knowledge of the truth. So it matters how you learn, and it matters how you study. But if you go after it, you'll find the knowledge. Find the knowledge of God. That's a wonderful thing. And that's, again, goes, that's the kind of measure. So this issue of this honest attendance toward the Father's words and honest in, inward engagement. Of, by the way, these things right here are, are, are in that parable that we looked at. I want to say Luke 13, but I keep getting it messed up in my head. Luke 13, where he, where he comes along and says he's, he, he's, the sower's got the seed and, and some fall by the wayside, fall, some fall on the rock, some fall on, on, uh, amongst the thorns, and then some fall, fell on good ground. One of them is what? The cares of the world. 
and the riches of the world. Uh, I forget the exact terminology used, but 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 uh, I can't think of it. Let's go over there real quick. I want to say it's Luke 13. Not Luke 13. Hold on one second. I want to show this to you, so I'm going to look it up here real quick. It very well may be. Bear with me one second. Is it Matthew 13? Luke 8. Come with me, Luke 8. It probably is Matthew 13 too, but um, the reason why I want the one in Luke is because uh, it talks about the, the good and honest heart. Luke 8. Never forget that again. It's usually something like that where it gets written on my heart. Uh, he gives the parable there, and then he's going to give the explanation, verse 9. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but others in parables, that, uh, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. And, and the disciples are the ones that are going to go after it. They want to see it. They want to understand it. And the Lord's going to give it to them. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. So we're dealing with the same type of thing. The, the word of God there, Proverbs is the words of the Father. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then come to the devil and take away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. There's some things going on with their hearts there, to the point where it's not taking root, and, and it, it gets taken away. Verse 13, they on the rock are they, which when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root. See, they hear it, and they receive it with joy, but it's, it's, it's not like they're applying their heart. They don't take it the next step. They say, which for a while, believe, and time of temptation, fall away. Now look at this one, verse 14. And that which fell among thorns are they, which when they have heard, go forth, and are choked. That's the word I was thinking of. And are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. Seekest her as what? silver, and searches for her as for hid treasures. And it's interesting, out here in the day of wrath, they're not going to have any money. They're not going to be able to buy or sell. That's what he talks about, again, we saw that last week in, in James and First Peter, that the trying of your faith is more precious than of gold. Look at the trying of your faith. That's the valuable thing. And the trying of it is just going to come unto glory, honor, and praise at the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, that is more valuable. And in that, add to your, your faith uh, virtue and virtue, godliness and godliness, patience and patience, charity, all those types of Add to your, s seek out this thing. It's more valuable. Even at the sake of your monetary Coinage and all that stuff. Money, finances. When, when they don't have it here. Verse 15. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, what? Is that what we talked about? There in Proverbs 2 verse 1. That if you receive my word, if thou wilt receive my words, and hide my commandments. And we talked about hiding as the issue of not just embarrassed of it, but you also have the issue of keeping and protect because you have something valuable. We talked about Moses, how his parents hid him to protect and keep him as long as they could from, from Pharaoh. 
That's the issue. We, we have heard it and we keep it. We don't, not keeping the law, we're keeping his word, his father's words. The word of God now. And bring forth fruit with patience. That's, that's the only one that there's fruit bearing. I don't know if you noticed that through the, through the seeds. Not that there is an issue. And that's the whole focus, by the way, is, is the fruit bearing. One has no root, can't even mature and grow up to bear fruit. The other one is choked out, so it's almost like it, it's starting to grow, but then it gets to this point where it's choked. And usually when a plant is choked, what ends up happening? It doesn't bear any fruit. But the one on good ground, that's the one that bears fruit. And I, I go to this because that's not far removed from Proverbs 2. And again, the measure of our response, he's giving insight to what the good and honest heart is. The good and honest heart doesn't value the other things of the world to the point where it gets choked. Now we've got to live in this world and operate in this world, but we don't get choked by the world to the point where we faint and, and, and those things become the emphasis of our life and not the real valuable thing. Nor of the issue of, what, oh, we received the joy, we received the word. That, that's verse uh, 13 there. I mean, that's most of Christianity today. I'm not saying there's direct, it's not a direct application of it. That's most of Christianity. Hey, receive the joy, let's go to church and hear some words of God and those type of things. Woo-hoo, yeah, woo! They go home and... They, got, they need another one. Another one that give me some joy. Another motivational, inspirational speech. And let's just keep getting them. Let's just keep getting them, getting them, getting them. And when they're not there... There's no substance. There's no value. There's nothing that, 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 there's no root in them. To when things get tough, oh, what is, what is, what's, what's God doing? What's God doing? God's giving you his word that in the midst of suffering, you can have some strength and comfort to get through it all. So don't have any root or choked. And here we have in God's word, the measure of our positive heart response ought to be one of a good and honest heart to receive his words that will incline our ears to his words, not the sinner's words. That we will, we will come along, we'll apply our hearts. That takes time. That, that, that again, Paul's going to say to Timothy, give thyself wholly to these things. Let's look at that. Look at... Uh, 2 Timothy. Oh, I want 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Back it up here. I mean, you have a, you have a, a similar passage than what we're looking at. This, the kind of information we're learning, you just see this repeated all over the place. Look at 1 Timothy 4. Look at verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed oh they're not inclining their ear to the father's words they're now inclining their ear to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and those ones are speaking lies here's the spirit speaking and here's some who've departed and they're speaking Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding the marrying, commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and, and of good doctrine. The doctrine that they have is doctrines of devils. It's evil doctrine. Whereunto thou hast attained, but refuse profane and old wise fables. Refuse it. Don't incline your ear to it. Refuse it. Get away from it. Don't try to mingle with it. And those, you, get, you take your stand by refusing it. Re 
Refuse profane and old wise fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promised the life that what? Now, now is and of that which is what? To come. The life that now is and the life that is to come. And he says this, This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer approach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers, in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Now look at verse 15. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself what? Holy, holy to them. He used that word holy over there in First Thessalonians, I believe it's chapter 5. He says your whole spirit, soul, and body. That thy what? Profiting. We've been talking about things of value here. The profiting is in these things, the, the, the good doctrine. That thy profiting may appear to all. And then he says, he gives a warning here. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. But if we're going to apply our heart to understanding, we need to meditate upon these things. Meditation isn't the issue like we think in the world. Is it let everything completely get out of our minds to reach this sense of euphoria of complete nothing. In fact, meditation is the exact opposite. It's taking everything that you know about God's word and thinking upon it, focusing upon it, especially in light of what you're reading and what you're studying and those type of things, and, and you're giving yourself wholly to it. You're not giving yourself up. You're giving yourself wholly to it. Spirit, soul, and body are engaged in the meditation of God's word. That's prayer. And all of that is part of the response and engagement that we are to have with God's, God's word. And the measured response he's looking, he's looking for. Now, yes, you can have lesser measures and still get a whole lot. But we're not... Why... When I, when I think of, it, of, of, of my job, my job is not to sell you short. Well, let's just have enough. Let's just have enough and then we, we'll get a little knowledge, a little understanding. Oh, that's not... God, God does... I got it all for you. He's, he says right here, he says, he, he, he just got done saying in verse 8, exercise thyself unto godliness, which he's given us, and he says it's profitable unto all things, not some things, all things, having promised a life that now is and of that which is to come. And then he says meditate upon all these things. He doesn't say meditate on some of them. He says meditate upon all of them. And he doesn't say give some of yourself to some of them. He never comes along and does that. That's, that's lawfulness. <laughs> Diligent, medita meditate upon all these, these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. And not just some people, but let your profiting appear to all, all people that you're in contact. So he's not, he, we, we, we can't just always settle for the least measure. Why would we? Why would we, knowing who our Father is, that He's given us everything that we need for the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, and that He's going to reward it in the life that is to come? That ought that, that, to move us toward Him that we want, we want it all. We want all the process. And again, that's what's, that's what's going into this, this positive response. So again, it's this honest attendance toward His words, an in, honest inward engagement with His words, a continual pursuit of his knowledge, a continual engagement with the Father's heart. And the issue there in Proverbs 2 verse 4 is seeking her as silver and searches for her as for head treasures. When you talk about the difference between seeking and searching, searching is there's more of a compelling. You put everything on hold for the sake of what you're searching out and it, it becomes your priority. It takes time and takes effort as we talked about. And so not only... 
all, we ought to see this as the, 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 the valuable and worthy pursuit toward our Father's heart. But I'm going to use Paul's word. It ought to be the preeminent pursuit of the Father's heart, no matter what the cost. No matter what the cost. Paul says that, he got, that God has placed everything in Christ that he might have the preeminence. If he's got the preeminence and we were going after him, then our pursuit of him ought to be preeminent. Meaning, it ought to surpass every other thing that we do. In fact, it ought to infiltrate everything else that we do. Not the other way around. Uh, since we're in uh, Paul's epistles, come with me to Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. preeminent pursuit of the Father's heart or the Father's knowledge and we know that the Son is the apple of His eye and therefore the Father's heart is His Son. The preeminent pursuit of the Father's heart no matter the cost. Paul deals with this over and over again but no other better place to look at it than Philippians chapter 3. Look at verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. Don't incline your ear to them, beware of them, and don't listen to them. He says, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Guess what the dogs, the evil workers, and the concision, guess where they place their confidence? In the flesh. Verse 4, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he had whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, the Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But, what things were, what? To me, those I counted, what? Loss. For who? For Christ. He's doing the same exact thing. He's coming along and he's saying, that is loss. That, that's, I, I'm not going to go after that anymore. And, and he's going to count it. Paul's doing this. Paul, in light of the knowledge and what he had, he looks at both of them. He sees what the one produces. He sees what the other produces. He says, this one's loss for this one. He doesn't stop there. Verse 8, yea, there's that word again. Yea, doubtless, no, no doubt. And I count all things. He, he, at, at least in Philippians, Paul's gone to this point where he's looking at this, and it's, it's, it's no-brainer, as we say sometimes. He's, he's, not, he's not struggling with this anymore. Ah, I just got to hold on. Now, there was a point in time that Paul did that. But at least at this juncture, he's not... Whew, this looks... He looks at this thing, and he doesn't say, well, this looks like a flower. What does he say this looks like? It's dung. That's not a pretty sight. He knows what it is, and that's one of the reasons why he's counting it loss. And he knows what he has before him and what's been given to him, and he esteems that. Yea, doubtless, and I, and I count. So he has counted it. He's presently counting it. And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the what? Knowledge. Isn't that what Proverbs is? Knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Here's the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung. Why? That I may what? You know it's possible to be in Christ and not win Christ? He's not talking about winning Christ here. You can only win Christ if you are in Christ. But just because you're in Christ doesn't mean you win Christ. You win Christ by counting everything else lost and dung 
for him. And you go after him, you pursue him, and you, you run after him. You walk after him. And all his things that Paul communicates to us, that's how you win him. So a big difference. He says, and be in him. And what do you mean by that, Paul? Not having my own righteousness. Guess what? If Paul would have stuck with that law, he would have had some righteousness, but it would have been his own. Not God's righteousness through the Spirit, him, and, and, and him utilizing that and producing the, those, that fruit. Which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and here it comes, and the fellowship of his what? Sufferings. <laughs> Being made conformable unto his what? Yeah. What did he cry before his death? Our Father. If by any means I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead, and he goes on. Again, one more passage to just kind of add to this issue of looking at one getting rid of it, seeing the other one, seeing it more valuable, and going after that one, hearing it, applying your heart to it, crying after it until you're not satisfied, until, you, until you finally you have the understanding, and, and knowing that there's probably more out there, and you want more understanding, you're going to keep going after it, and the issue of making it a priority. You seek it and you search it. You prioritize everything else around this, because this is on the mantle. This is, this is supreme. This is superior. And folks, this isn't legalism. Going after God specifically through what Paul teaches and going after it and organizing your life in such a manner to accommodate going after it because of what's in you, because of what you know is at your fingertips and what he's provided you, that's not legalism. That's what we ought to be doing. There's this false impression out there that, man, if I get down on myself because I'm not reading God's word, oh, I'm under legalism. I'm not saying you have to get down on yourself, but use that to get back in it. Go after it. This is your life. This is your lifeline. This is your reward. This is your wisdom and your knowledge. This is what your being should be as you go about making decisions. And so, yeah, we, we need it. We need it more than we need our physical food. We don't come along and say, oh, well, i got to get down on myself because I didn't eat. When we think of that about people, we think that they have a disease, by the way. And so there's, don't, don't fall victim to that type of thinking of this, this, this legalism thinking that, well, if I set up a, day each, uh, a time each day to get in God's word and I miss it, and I kind of get sad that that's legalism. What? No, I get sad, it's your life. I'm not saying you gotta beat yourself up, and condemn yourself, then that would be, but, but, but get back in it, use it. When I'm not, when I'm not in this, I'm sad. And I have no problem being sad. I don't condemn myself. I have no problem being sad. You know what that moves me to? I don't want to be sad anymore. And I know, where my I know where my life is. I know where the knowledge is. I know where the power is. It's right here. And you know what? I renew my mind towards it and I, 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 I start to change what needs to be changed. Everyone's life's different. All, all of our, our, our duties and our activities that we go through and how many children you have or you don't have, all that's different. The job and the stress of the job and how, all of that is different for each and every one of us. But here's what's the same. That ought to be our priority. And no matter how we change and shift things in our life, that's going to all look different. But guess what? We should all be shifting and changing, making that the priority. So th then we're making Christ the priority, the one who died for us. The one who died for us. And we have eternal life. And he says, oh, by the way, you can be with me, glorify together with me. 
and reign with me, I'll reward you for some things if you follow after me, if you walk after my spirit. It's a, it's a, it's a change of thinking. And I know what you're probably thinking, because I've thought the same thing. Guilt. Oh, yeah, you're right. I just don't do it enough. Just don't think that way. Just get, don't feel guilt. Don't, don't get involved in that type of mind flipping of what could have been. Think about what now is. And what tomorrow is. And what the next day is. And just, and then you're going to fall. I, we, we're all going to get away from it. We're all going to, that's, the issue is now, just start minding the things of the Spirit. Just start getting into it now. Get into it again. Because it's worth it. It's valuable. It's worth at least me keep going after it, even though I might fall down. I used to think that that was in me because I played basketball. I'll get off my box here in a second. I used to think that was in me because of basketball. And there was that time where I was struggling with, is this in me just to get back up when I fail, when I miss 10 shots, should I keep shooting? I know it sounds really silly to you. Man, I can't, I can't dribble between my legs. And I just got to keep working at it. I used to, I used to struggle. Is that because of me getting the basketball? And then finally, I put down basketball for, for quite a few years. And I, start, and, 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 and I started seeing that God's word, and I'm not saying it's in me perfectly, but what God's word provides us is just come along and when, when we're not this way, Paul, time after time with the Corinthians, his patience and long suffering, his forbearance with the Corinthians, it was just the issue, get it going, get it going. He tells Timothy, stir up the gift that's in you. Stir it up if you need to, remember. He always talks about remember, remember these things. Go back to the base and then, and then start getting back into it and whatever you need to do. And, 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 and we're doing all that not for the sake of getting brownie points with God just because we're doing it. We're doing that because we know we're going after Christ. And that's what we want. And what I mean by going after Christ is not some cliche thing. I mean, get his mind in us. Get his thinking. Because that not only has promise of the life that now is, but the life that is to come. And we can gain practice now for what's going to be then. That's the, some of the things that the father's looking for from his son in Proverbs. And the very thing that, that Christ had, the very thing that, that Paul had, Paul didn't have it perfectly, but he, he, would, he would continue to go after it. And he knew Timothy wasn't perfect. Timothy fainted a lot of times. He picked up Timothy and Timothy went on and those type of things. And, and so this is part of the crying of Abba Father is to pursue him no matter what. Now come with me to Luke 2. Luke chapter 2. And we'll end our last about five minutes or so here in Luke 2. There's a lot more to say about all this, but this will get a good, good foundation for what we build upon it later. Now, we've been here before in Luke chapter 2 when the Lord is 12 years old. But if you can look at three main things, look at the Lord's honest attendance and honest engagement. Look at the Lord's interaction with who are going to be the doctors and lawyers here, as well as he's making a priority. Uh, look at Luke, Luke 2, and uh, let's pick it up here in verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the, the, Lord, uh, sorry, the child Jesus carried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. These things, when you kind of have these things in your back of your mind, you start looking at a, a passage like this a little differently. He's staying back. You ask, you wonder, why is he doing this? Well, verse 44, But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they saw him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. 
And when they found not him, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the where? In the temple. Sitting in the midst, in the midst. Not, he's not just sitting in the back row. He's sitting in the midst of the doctors, both what? Hearing them and asking them questions. There he is. He's attending. And not only is he attending, he's interacting with them. Now, again, we know the, these doctors and those type of things, but nevertheless, you get, you, get the, you get the kind of feel for this. Verse 47. And all that heard him were astonished at his what? Understanding, Understanding and his answers. And that answer is not necessarily, it could just be an addition to some replies and questions and those type of things. And when they saw him, as his parents, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, so here he is. He's in the temple. He's attending to where the word of God ought to be. And he's engaging with the word of God. And now his parents come and say, why have you dealt with us as thus? Thou thus dealt with us. Verse 49, he said unto them, how is it that you sought me? Wist ye not that I, what's the next word? Man, words make so much, it means so much. He doesn't say, wish not that I ought to be about my father's business. He says, I must. It was his life. It was his priority. I must be about my father's business. Now look at verse 50. And they understood not the saying which he spake of, unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them, but his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Now remember, we just got done looking at that honest attendance, the engaging with the information and making it a priority. Then you find what? The knowledge of God, right? Then you understand the fear of the Lord. Now look at verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. There's the result. I know it's not the same exact words, but the concept is there. And this, again, is not a dispensational issue. This is an interdispensational issue from the beginning to the end of the kind of response that God's looking for after one has believed that they're justified in regards to the relationship with God is they need to fear the Lord. They need to positively respond to Him, not shrink back and move toward because of who He is, what He has for them, and what He can produce. And then, they, and, and then and He's going to exhort them to hear. Hear what I have to say, and here's how you hear. Here's the measure I want you to hear. I want you to Attend to my, incline into my ear. I've adopted you. I've brought you unto myself to teach you how foolish would it be for us to not listen. So listen, engage with the inf information, and, and make it a priority. And you have those things. And there's even growth um, in those things. You have those things, most fundamentally, and you're going to find the knowledge. You're going to come to some understanding. You're going to come to know me. You're going to increase in the wisdom. Now I'm, trying to I'm going to try to communicate wisdom unto you so that you can increase in that wisdom. But if you don't listen, how are you going to increase? If you don't engage with me in this process, how are you going to increase? If you don't make it a priority and just put it on the back burner, well, yeah, you might increase, but it's not going to be to the, to the measure which you could. And so all these things factor into... Of, of what we can come to know and understanding and go, going after Christ and his wisdom, his knowledge, his understanding. To, we, the, the mind of Christ is available to us in God's word now. That's where it is. It's not, it's not invisible and just out there and hopefully we can come to it. It's in God's word now. The issue is study his word. Read his word. Study his word. Meditate upon it. Get his word so you can gain that out of it. 
and, and give yourself wholly to it. Well, let's end in Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. I hope, at least if it's just in a little bit, that that expression means more to you than maybe it did at the first. And if it, that's how you understood it at the first, that is absolutely terrific. Well, too often, myself being one of them, we just you kind of go through that, cry of a father and not necessarily know what it means and, or some things involved in it and those type of things. And one, we should see that, again, the spirit of adoption is the means and the cause of why we're crying. And second, if we're going to cry anything, it's because something has impressed us. Something has, has, something has gotten our attention that is, that is so grand, whether it's, whether it's, again, that vexation or that joy, it's... it's impacted us and what ought to be impacting us is the issue that we're his sons and his daughters and what that means is that we're no longer under the tutors and governors having worked out the spirit of bondage again to fear in us but rather he's taken us under his wing and through his word the spirit's going to lead us to educate us in his business to get his his mind there it is to get his mind his thinking his purpose his will his reasoning his intents all these things to, to, to communicate them to us and the issue now at the outset ought to be the issue of a positive heart cry of gratitude and thankfulness and and one that has at its outset that you want to attend now to these things, that you want to engage yourself with these things and, 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 and make these things a priority. And as you do that, then the rest of what he's going to give us, you're going to come to that understanding. And, and you'll always, we'll always have room to understand more and more and more. But the most fundamental understanding of a certain verse, certain path, you'll, you'll get that. And that's what we're going to begin to go through, and we're going to start it next week. We're going to start verse 16 through 25 is a section of information there. And it is tremendous information because what it's doing is it's, it's giving us our glory ahead of us. Just as Christ had the joy that was set before him, and, and, and because of that he despised the shame and he endured patiently the cross, and the contradiction of sinners. So too now is, is, is Paul, God our Father through Paul, is going to expand upon the glory that he's already talked about in Romans 5, and he's going to give it further detail. And even here it's going to be general, but he's going to give it further detail so that we can have it as a, as a unit of information for it to be our joy and our glory that can give us some fortitude and comfort as we go through, and patience, by the way, to go through this life and the present time sufferings that we're, we all encounter. And therefore, he's go, therefore it works. Look what he says there in verse 18. He says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And we're going to have to start seeing that with the eyes of our understanding, again, is greater than what we are presently going through. It's, it's looking at something invisible, in the visible. It's the issue of now walking by faith, not by sight. Because everything with our sight around us is going to tell us and teach us something different. And everyone who does walk by their sight is going to tell you and teach you something different. But we now know that the exclusive information that we need to learn and we need to rely upon is our Father's words starting right now. It was before, but even more so now, Right now, verse 16. 
And he's going to go right to work. He's going to start teaching us. And he's going to, we're going to have to perceive some things. With the, we're going to have to perceive the words of understanding and get our why. You know, everyone gets a why. My wife talks about this now. Everyone has a why. And that why is what will drive you. And what will drive you in the midst of obstacles and hills and bumps in the road and sufferings, all, that why will drive you. And there are some pretty strong earthly whys you can have. But all of them are not worthy to be compared with his why. What, what, why? Why have you saved us? Why the dispensation of God's grace? Why are we still in the, 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 these bodies? Why? What's coming ahead of us? Why? And it's in light of that. And having that, it, will, it ought to change your mind drastically. If you, if you engage with it, if you allow it to work in you, and, and you give your heart to it, it will drastically shame, change your perspective of life now, and it will give you strength. It will give you comfort, and it will give you one of the greatest, one of the other greatest powers I got. It will give you grand hope. And those things, that, that, that's power. That's power, and Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries. Your adversaries can try to strip everything from you, take everything from you, and you still have your hope, and you just say, I'm not terrified by this. In fact, this is working for me. It's working for me. To have that thinking is out of this world, and I mean that. That's our Father's thinking. To be able to look at everything that's coming your way and, and, and not rip out your hair. I didn't do that, by the way. <laughs> rip out your hair, or start shaking, or get so afraid and, and throw your arms up in the air and faint, and I don't want to do anything. I don't want to see anyone. I don't want. But be able to stand and say, This is working for me right now. This is working for me. And be able to go through it. It's unparalleled to anything else. And we're going to learn it starting next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to get into your word. And to look at the response that we ought to have. And if we could get a, a microscope into the reins of our inner man. From your perspective to see what you're looking for. Uh, then it's these things. And all these things are reflective of what's going on in, inwardly. And Father, I pray for all of us that these things would, again, begin to, to, to prick our hearts positively. All the guilt and possibly shame or what if or I could have done this better or all that is, we ought to count that as dung as well because it's not going to propel us forward, but rather to get our minds on the things of the Spirit and mind the things of the Spirit and start taking in these things and, and having them be, become our life. And if they start to fall by the wayside, then we come along and begin to mind them again. And if we see how valuable you are and how worth worth it it is and the, the ability or the, the privilege you, you have put us in to win Christ then that might be the that, that would be the anchor of our constraining to go after you Father we thank you for your word to be able to look into these matters and I pray that as we get done now at least for a time dealing with this issue of Abba Father and our cry of Abba Father that we would examine ourselves to see if these things are impressing us that is that we have received the spirit of adoption and that you're going to educate us in your will today and the glory that you hold out to us and the wisdom and knowledge and understanding that you hold out to us and that the eternal value in it all 
that fruit unto holiness, the end of it is everlasting life. It has no end. But rather, fruit in the wisdom of the world and fruit under the law and all those type of things is, is just death. It, it cannot proceed on and therefore has no value, no true value to us. So Father, may these things not only strike us, but we, may we begin to rejoice in them. Rejoice in the fact that we're your sons and daughters and that you have given us some wisdom and understanding and knowledge for us to gain, appreciate, and therefore, and, and by it, receive your mind and be able to view life the way in which you view life and view the life that is to come the way in which you view it now. Father, I thank you for these saints and their faithfulness and to go through these things and we, we, we just thank you so much. We thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone's here listening. Beyond, before any of all, all this, uh, they need to trust that Christ is their all-sufficient Savior. How they died for their sins, was buried and rose again. He had to die for their sins because your wrath is against their sin, their unrighteousness and their ungodliness, and there's nothing that they can do to escape it. But you sent your son to die on the cross for them. And the moment they believe that wonderful news, they'll be justified unto eternal life, meaning all their sins will be forgiven, past, present, and future, and your righteousness will be imputed unto them, and they will therefore possess the gift of eternal life. May they believe this very moment. It's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen.